Father, we do long for the day when our faith is sight and our prayer will turn to praise, where our communion with you will look so radically different than it does now. And Lord, we do not want to be anxious for that day for any selfish reason. We know that you have us here for a purpose, as long as you do. We know that you have more glory to gain for yourself by leaving your church militant here on earth, standing for truth, denying the world, living for Christ. And we pray that you would glorify your name and your son through us, through your church. And we know that you alone can do that by the power of your spirit, which is why we look to you right now in prayer. This is also why we open your word and preach your word and study your word as we gather as your church, because Lord, no mere man is the head of the church, the God-man, your son, is the only head of the church. So this morning we have gathered to sing your praises, to encourage one another in truth, and to hear from Jesus Christ. So Lord, as we open your word, we do pray that you would glorify your name, that you would speak to us, not in a mystical sense of speaking in or around or behind your word, but that your word, as you actually wrote it, which continues to speak, that it would speak to us. The meaning of what you've actually said, that it would profoundly inform us and correct us and guide us, that it would encourage us, and that as a result of it, Lord, that we as your church would worship your Son, the Son of God, with spirit and with truth. And so as we turn our attention to your word now, we know that uh, worship will merely continue. So we thank you for this moment. We thank you for this opportunity. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. What a great way to head into a sermon uh, with that song. Matt, I don't know if I've ever told you, I, I certainly I love that song. I mean, it's one of my favorites, probably, if not my very favorite. Um, and, it, you know, it's, 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 it's hard not to sing that song and love it for its content, but I also have a lot going on in my own mind when I sing it because uh, before that song kind of became popular, uh, or at least before that arrangement became popular, uh, I came across it right as a, as a brand new believer. I was reading um, Lloyd Jones' commentary on Romans in Volume Five. He has, has this quote, and I didn't. And it just said Francis Light. That's all I knew. Some guy in the 1800s writes this incredible lyric, and he just writes that that line there: "Perish every fond ambition, all I sought or hoped or known." And I was so impressed by by that lyric. And it probably was about um, six years later when I first heard that arrangement. And uh, so I just, I've loved it. And it's just, uh, it's just hard not to think about God's grace to me uh, as, a, as a baby, baby Christian, reading that commentary, seeing those lyrics. And so it brings a lot of memories back. So thank you for leading us in song and preparing us for worship. Well, I want to ask you and invite you to grab your Bibles and open up to the book of Mark. Once again, the book of Mark, chapter 1. We're going to introduce a, sec- a, a, a text that we're not going to preach. One more week of introducing the wrong text. Uh, we're going to read Mark 1, 1 through 8, and um, Lord willing, we'll get to this next time. <laughs> I appreciate that you get, a few of you can laugh. Some of you are like, come on already, just get to Mark 1. Mark 1, verses 1 to 8, and um, I just want to read the introductory quote because this is, again, why we're not quite ready for this section. Is because the, the quote that Mark gives us has three Old Testament texts. And so let me just read verses 1 through 3. Here's what he writes. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah, the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. This is a profound quote, and as I mentioned last time, we looked at verse 2. Verse 2 is, for the most part, 
a quote from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, with the notable exception of his pronouns. His pronouns are all wrong. And you first read that, and you compare it to where he drew it from in the Old Testament, and you think, whoa, did, did Mark make a mistake here? And we realize, no, he did not. He's reading his, his Old Testament robustly. He knows his Old Testament. He's reading it in context. And so he understands that prophecy in Malachi 3 has a whole uh, context for it, starting in Exodus uh, going all the way through the, the canon uh, of the identity of this of, of the messenger who comes in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. And so, you think, well, why does he introduce his quote in verse 2 by saying this is what is written in Isaiah the prophet? Well, he doesn't get to the quote from Isaiah until verse 3, and that's particularly the line there. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight, and that is from Isaiah chapter 40. So this morning we're going to spend the bulk of our time in Isaiah. So I'm going to ask you to turn back to Isaiah. And we're going to, we're going to look at this, this prophecy. And as you're turning there, I just want to make a, a brief explanation of why I believe this is so, so important. As you can see, the, the, Mark is writing this gospel and he, he's very aware of what the Old Testament means He's very aware of what the Old Testament is doing. He's very aware of what the Old Testament is pointing to. And hopefully after two weeks of very quick kind of almost like biblical theology, just broad brush strokes as we look at Genesis to Malachi, we'll be ready to get to the Gospel of Mark because Mark says, yeah, he's here. He's here. And the prophecy of Isaiah is just it's so important to understand what's happening here. And so we're going to look at, first of all, the prophecy itself, this section of the prophecy. And then I'm going to, uh, that's going to be like the first half of our time here, is looking at Isaiah 40 to verses 1 through 11. And then our second half of our time here is going to be looking at Isaiah uh, more broadly uh, for very specific reason. Namely, the quote that that Mark is quoting from comes at the hinge of the book of Isaiah. It virtually is pointing to a transition in the whole prophecy, and it's really pointing to the bulk of the last 27 chapters, and that's in Mark's mind as he makes this comment. And so I'm going to try to do a little bit of work in Isaiah to help us get ready for the Gospel of Mark. There's just so much in Isaiah, uh, so it's not a question of what to say. It's always a question of what not to say. And the way I made that decision was, I'll try to just cut out everything that's not so explicitly have to do with Mark that we can afford to miss it. Uh, and then even then, I was left with way too much for half a sermon. So we are editing radically to just look at some of the major, major themes that Mark is picking up on when he reads this prophecy from Isaiah 40 to, to write his gospel. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1, are very familiar words, some of the most familiar, most um, from, uh, famous words from the whole prophecy. Verse 1 says, Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now, this, um, this section of Isaiah is, is, a, is a profound section. Sometimes the whole book of, of Isaiah is called the, the miniature Bible because it's 66 chapters, like the Bible has 66 books. And the chapters 1 through 39 uh, have, a, have an overwhelming emphasis on Israel's sin, and so it's a warning, and it's a lot of a lot of a reminder that Israel is not doing well spiritually. Um, in 40, right here, this particular prophecy becomes a radical transition of looking forward to the future. And interestingly enough, um, if you studied Isaiah 40 to Isaiah 66, there's one refrain that stand, will stand out to you. And that is the refrain, there is no peace for the wicked. And we don't have time to, do, to look at everything in between, but let me show you that refrain, and then we'll come right back to 40 verse 1. Go to the end of chapter 48, and Isaiah writes in the very last verse of Isaiah 48, Verse 22, there is no peace for the wicked, says the Lord. There's no peace for the wicked. Skip over to Isaiah 57 and look at the very last verse of Isaiah 57. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. 
And you're probably seeing the refrain, it's pretty clear. But it's also interesting that even in the way the chapters break up, it's a nine chapter seg segments of the last 27 chapters of the book of Isaiah. The first nine end with there's no peace for the wicked. The next nine end with there's no peace for the wicked. Well, what about the last nine? Look at the last few verses of Isaiah 66. Isaiah 65 begins prophesying about the new heavens and the new earth. 66 continues in that thread. And in verse 21, for instance, Isaiah writes, I will take some of them for priests and for Levites, says the Lord. And um, that's talking about people coming from the nations, which is a profound prophecy. Verse 22, for just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I make, will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure. And it shall be from new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, all mankind will come to bow down before me, says the Lord. So far, it's just a prophecy of, of radical glory, of global glory, where every nation and all peoples who are um, in this new heaven and new earth are worshiping Yahweh. Verse 24, And then they will go forth and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm will not die, and their fire will not be quenched, and they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. In a, honestly, just a gut-wrenching verse. It's a picture of the people in the new heavens and the new earth going forth and peering over the edge and looking at what it actually means for there to be no peace for the wicked. It just pictures it. There is no peace for the wicked. In fact, he describes them as corpses because they are, this is the ultimate sense of dead, though they continue to exist. And because they've transgressed against me, the divine speaker, their worm will not die, their fire will not be quenched, and they're an abhorrence to all mankind. And that refrain structures those last three prophecies. So the thread of chapters 1 through 39 are not forgotten. They're still in front of us. But the guts of these prophecies are, are so profound and so full of comfort. So go back to chapter 40, verse 1 and 2. I mean, the refrain stays the same, but the, the guts of these prophecies are fulfilling the command of verse 1, comfort, oh, comfort my people. It's interesting in the original Hebrew that these are imperatives that, and they're plural. So it's commanding uh, plural, you all, <laughs> uh, you plural, give comfort to my people. And we're going to see uh, who, those, who those people are because it's more than one person. And we're going to see that in just a second. But notice the message. There are three messages of comfort in verse 2. It just says, speak kindly, speak to the heart. Uh, speak to Jerusalem to the heart. It's, very, it's speaking kindly. It woos the nation. It woos the people of God. It's, it's winning them over. And it says, and call out to her. And then there's three things. Call out to her. First of all, that her warfare has ended. Secondly, that her iniquity has been removed. Third, that she has received of the Lord's hands double for all her sin. Three messages. Call out these three distinct messages. Three distinct messages of comfort. And then when you read the rest of the prophecy and you realize there's this threefold refrain, it's pretty fascinating to read the content of those prophecies and to realize this really functions as an outline for the next 27 chapters of the book. Chapters 40 to 48 really explain how Israel's warfare has ended. And God describes himself as a God with, without comparison. There's no other God. There's no one else who can deliver like he can. And he actually declares, I'm going to deliver my people and I'm going to make sure that I get them safely out of exile and into the promised land and they're going to be, dwell with me and be my people. He's just incomparable in his commitment to end Israel's warfare and to deliver them from foreign powers. The second message, 42b, her iniquity is removed. Well, that really is a great title for chapters 49 to 57. In fact, in those chapters, those are some of the most familiar chapters to you probably because of the servant songs. A picture of a suffering servant who's going to deliver Israel from her sin. In fact, most famously, Isaiah 53, he's going to take on our transgressions and take on our iniquities. 
so that the many will be justified. That's good news. This is comfort to the nation because her iniquities have been removed. And then the third message in 40 verse, uh, 40, 40 verse 2, C, that she has received from the Lord's hands double for all her sins. And uh, a few people you know, take that as that she's received twice for her sin what she deserves, um, which, which, I mean, it couldn't mean you received twice what you've deserved. Um, in an eternal sense, God only punishes what our sin deserves. He's never unjust, unjust in, his, just in, his, in his distribution of judgment. This is, they've received double or an abundance in spite of her sin. And let me show you one, one quick example from the third section. It goes, uh, turn over to Isaiah 61, and you can see why um, um, I do believe this is the right interpretation of that phrase. Um, this prophecy from 59 to 66 show Israel and Zion's incredible future, how glorious it's going to be. Indeed, they have received um, a double. Um, verse, six, chapter 61, verse 7 says, Instead of your shame, you will have a double portion. Instead of humiliation, they will shout over joy, for joy over their portion. Therefore, they will possess a double portion in their land. Everlasting joy will be theirs. I mean, at times in this third section, Israel is pleading for the f fulfillment of promises, and that's exactly what happens, especially by the time you get to chapter 65. Uh, you have God making a distinction between his servants and those who have forsaken him, and they dwell, uh, enjoy uh, the pr presence of God on earth in the new heavens and the new earth. Furthermore, when you realize that the second section, chapter 49, begins with the reference to these words, listen to me. The Lord has called me from the womb. He has made my mouth like a sword. And then you read the rest of that prophecy and you realize it's a divine speaker speaking those things. A divine speaker taking on human form who is none other than the suffering servant who is also in Isaiah 53. You realize that the emphasis there is on a voice. Chapter 58 begins the third section of prophecy. Cry out loudly, raise your voice like a trumpet. And so we should not be surprised when the first prophecy of this first section in chapter 40 to 48 begins also with a voice. So now look at chapter 40, verse 3 through 11. This is the proper prophecy, the quote where Mark gets his material. And you'll notice in verses 3, 6, and 9, an explicit reference to voice. 3, it says, a voice is calling. In verse 6, a voice is says and in verse 9 in the third line lift up your voice mightily and so there's three voices in this prophecy these three voices have three messages they all overlap and they're all profoundly rich and they're all important for understanding where where Isaiah goes in his prophecy but I'm just going to briefly look through look through these three um, um, voices with you and this is really going to just be pretty quick Let's dive into verses three through five. This first voice shows the path for God's glory. The voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is a, a profound quote. There is a voice calling, and this voice is calling out, uh, apparently, not a divine speaker, which is kind of unique for this section of prophecy. Because in verse 3, at the very end, it says, Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. This is a human voice. This human voice is saying, clear the way, make ready, make it accessible. And so if you pictured making a highway through uh, this country, you can picture mountains being made low and bridges being built up between uh, massive valleys or a little low point being filled in with the debris from bringing down a high place so that you can make a highway and make it super smooth. And the point is just making it accessible. Now, what's interesting about this is this voice is making 
the way of the Lord accessible. Preparing for God's arrival. That's Isaiah's prophecy here. God's coming. And there's going to be a human voice preparing the way so that when he comes, verse 5 says, the glory of Yahweh will be revealed and all flesh will see it together. All flesh on the face of the planet will see the glory of Yahweh when God shows up in person. Are you sure? 5C, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Yes, it's sure. This is a profound prophecy. God's coming, so prepare the way. Make it smooth. Make it accessible. This will become clear, hopefully, by the time we're done, but the reason why the way of the Lord needs preparation, the reason why it's, it needs work to be prepared and made clear is not because the Lord lacks ability. The reason why is because his people aren't ready for him to come. As he says in Isaiah 59, your sins separate you from God. The sins of the nation are going to prevent God from showing up and establishing a kingdom or for God to show up and for that to be good news. Because if God shows up and the nation does not embrace him, that would be tragic for that generation. And so, Isaiah, from before Christ's perspective, from before Christ comes, Isaiah can just say, he's coming. And there's going to be a human voice preparing the way. Which, of course, is why Mark says, yep, John the Baptist came, and Jesus did, too. Prepare the way. The preparation is going to require profound national level of repentance. Let's look at the second voice. voice verse 6. A voice says, call out. And he says, what shall I call out? All flesh is grass, and its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. This second voice is saying there is permanence to God's word. God's word has permanence. So what's interesting is the radical contrast uh, between the flesh, of the, the, the flesh of man and the word of God, which is compared, the men, men are compared to grass withering. Now what's interesting in verse 6 is we don't know, just like in verse 3, there's no identity to this voice. It's not identified. In fact, that's not even the point. The point is the content of the message. The point is, is that this voice is sitting there saying, what shall I call out? What should I tell people? And the message is, man has no power, literally glory. The Hebrew original is man's power is fading. And the Greek translation of it is his glory is, is like the grass, which is an appropriate translation because that's the significance of man's strength and man's power is his glory. It's worthless. Man has no ability to bring about this prophecy. He has no ability to um, bring God from heaven down to earth. Interestingly enough, in verse 6, when Isaiah records this voice saying, all flesh is grass and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field, the word loveliness is the Hebrew word said, which is God, it's typically used of God for God's loyal, loving kindness, his loyal, steadfast faithfulness, and his commitment to his purposes. God has, has said, because he never compromises, he never goes back on his word, he is always righteous, whatever he says comes true, he's never lied, he's never exaggerated, and when he commits to something, it becomes fact. Man, on the other hand, his loyal loving kindness is just like the grass, it's like the flower of the field, it fades, it withers. God just blows on man and he just shrivels up. The breath of the Lord dries up all of man's abilities. But then there's the word of the Lord standing forever. The word of the Lord remains. Isaiah writes this prophecy, and I mean, honestly, I, I maybe glory with me, <laughs> if you will. It's a little, hopefully a little bit of inspired, inspired illustration of just imagining what that would have been like for Isaiah. 
I don't think it was too much different for him than it is for faithful people today. He's, he's bringing this message, and people in his day would have been like, are you kidding me? Is that really, oh, Isaiah said that, really? And all the skeptics bring question, and they bring slander, and they question whether it's true. Isaiah might make a prophecy that's going to be fulfilled in 400 years, and they would say, yeah, that, yeah, right, sure. And then he makes a prophecy fulfilled in his lifetime, a few years away, and they're like, yeah, right. And then it becomes fulfilled, and then they're like, oh, okay, well. And they just move on to new excuses, not to believe it. And isn't that the way it works today? It's like we read the scriptures, and people, the skeptics, look at the scriptures and say, oh, okay, this isn't true because there's no archaeological evidence. This just in, we found archaeological Oh, okay, well, it's not true because of, oh, and all the excuses have just worn out. And the word of God stands forever. God says it. It's fact. It stands forever. It is unalterable. If there is something spoken by God in this book, it is fact. Even if it hasn't occurred yet, it's fact. God's word stands. And so... When God is sitting here in this prophecy, speaking to a sinful nation, saying, God is coming, my presence is drawing near, it's fact. Third voice is in verses 9 through 11. In verse 9 through 11, we see these words, Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. And now you realize that the third voice is totally identified, and it's actually Zion, or Jerusalem, the city personified. That's the city of God's presence when the Son of David comes to rule and to reign. So now, the city itself is personified as the evangelist. Zion, Jerusalem, you got some good news. Go tell everybody. Go pro pro proclaim good tidings. And this proclamation is the proclamation of God's presence. What are they supposed to say? In the middle of verse 9, lift up your voice, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Here's God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. I mean, this is a prophecy about Zion being evangelistic about the good news. Good news, we talk about good news a lot, and appropriately so, because good news is what we're here for is to proclaim good news to a lost and dying world. Isaiah, he had that word well before Mark even used it. Good news is God's arriving. He's coming to earth. He's coming to fulfill his redemptive purposes, his redemptive promises, because his word stands forever. He's promising to save a nation that is unbelieving. It's guaranteed. And so now he says here, God's coming, he's going to rule, he's going to reign, he's going to establish dominion on earth. His reward and his recompense, uh, that's, his, that's, that's the reward and recompense of his own presence with his own people. Now, at this point in the prophecy, if you're following this voice, this voice is saying, good news, God's coming to earth. You might imagine, what's that going to look like? We could probably imagine a lot of things that would be a waste of time to imagine. We could also take a lot of imagery from the Bible, and it would be appropriate at this point to insert into the uh, prophecy other biblical imagery, other biblical um, emphases of what's going to be like for God to show up on earth. We could picture God showing up as a lion. We could picture God showing up as a judge. We could picture him, as is later in the uh, prophecy of Isaiah, um, a wine press trampling his enemies, staining his garment with the blood of his opponents. We, should, we could picture God coming with a scepter in his hand. We could picture God coming on a throne. We could picture the Ancient of Days, like Daniel 7, sitting on a throne in a dominion over the earth. We could picture him, like earlier in Isaiah, chapter 6, sitting in the temple on a throne like a priest king, his sandals on earth, the hem of his garment filling the temple. Seraphim, back and forth, singing, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. And any of those are biblical imagery of God coming to earth. Look at verse 11. 
It's not the imagery here. What's the imagery of God coming to earth? Like a shepherd, he'll tend his flock. In his arm he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. This is profound. God comes to earth in human form as a shepherd shepherding sheep, caring for sheep that otherwise would have no leadership, that otherwise would not have food or water, that otherwise would not have direction. By the way, don't miss, don't miss the consistency in this prophecy. Every single one of these voices ends with the same thing. Go back to verse 5. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Go back to verse 8. The word of our God stands forever. And now verse 11, he's going to shepherd his sheep like a shepherd. He's going to shepherd his sheep by instructing them with truth. That's good news. Already, we could start to hopefully point some uh, directions toward the Gospel of Mark. We're going to be diving into the Gospel of Mark in the coming weeks and months. And when you get into the book of Mark, and you realize in the very first chapter of Mark, you know, there's a story where Jesus is uh, ministering in Galilee, and so many people are interested in getting healed or seeing a miracle that they're they're thronging to him, and he just says, we need to go elsewhere so that I can preach, because that's what I came for. You realize Jesus is the shepherd, and he came to shepherd his sheep, and he came to shepherd his sheep with truth, to lead them in truth and lead them into righteousness. And so this is a prophecy of good news about God coming to earth in human form. Now, with our remaining time, I want to look at a few threads that run through the book of Isaiah that are going to help us appreciate what's going on in this prophecy. First of all, did you notice that the, there's a key word in verse 3 that Mark quotes, and namely he says, clear the way for the Lord. Now, the way might not stand out. The way? Is that such a technical term? That is the term that is the common denominator between Exodus 23, Isaiah 40, Malachi 3, Mark chapter 1, the way. So that does become very important for us. So I need to take a few minutes here and just show you something about the way. The word way means way. (laughs) It means path. It means a trajectory, a course. But we were introduced to this back in Exodus. And so it is connected to the way that God brought his people out of slavery into the promised land. But We do not want to think about this superficially. We we need to understand this and appreciate it for for all that it is. This is not just a way geographically of getting Israel from Egypt to promised land. It's actually uh, much more important. It's uh, it's actually more of a trajectory that involves a lot of fulfillment and a lot of promise. You know, if you uh, planned a family vacation and you worked hard to get everybody ready to go and you've got it on the calendar and you're getting in the car and your, your spouse says, oh, do you know where you're going? And you say, well, of course I know the way. You know, knowing which highway to get on and where to get off and the exit and the, on, you know, and the frontage road and the actual address, that's one thing. But perhaps you might say, for the sake of this purpose and for this use of way, the better, but the better use of way would be, have you prepared the way for family vacation to go well? We would involve reservations being made and the funds being in the savings account and you know where we're going to eat and where the food's going to come from and there's been activities planned and we're already and we're prepared and we, we, we love just dying to our own preferences and serving other people and we're going to have a sweet time and we're committed to that. And so a godly attitude and everything else that goes into vacation going well. It's just much different than this freeway, that freeway, this back road and then get off. When God talks about the way... He's talking about the path of getting Israel all the way to the promised land. Let's go back and look at, thank you. Let's go back and look at, um, I was wondering if I even needed that, but I, I appreciate that. I think, we're, I think, I think we're, we're past it. If we weren't past it, I was going to skip it anyway, but now, now, we're, now we're set, so I appreciate that, Emmanuel. <laughs> 
Let's go back to uh, let's go back to Exodus for a second. And you'll remember that we looked at this last week, this, pro- this um, profound statement about the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the covenant, the angel of Yahweh, in Exodus chapter 23, verse 20. Exodus 23, verse 20. Behold, I'm going to send an angel, or messenger, before you to guard you along the way. Now, the messenger here is the messenger of the covenant in Malachi. So remember, Malachi has two messengers, a human messenger and a divine slash human messenger. This is the messenger of Yahweh, the messenger of the covenant, who is clearly in this, past, in this context divine. And he is the messenger of, of Yahweh who is going to prepare a place before you, namely Israel, the people. And he's going to guard you along the way. This way is the path of getting out of slavery and getting into the promised land. He's going to bring you to the place which which I have prepared. And then verse 23 explains, My angel will go before you. He'll bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites. He's going to get you there. In fact, his function, if you remember, is that he's going to oppose all who oppose you. And that's part of the guarantee of what it means to be the messenger of the covenant. He's going to get you there. So... Did the angel of the Lord get them to the promised land? Well, of course. They got there 40 years later because of their sin. But was that the fulfillment? Was that the fulfillment of, I've got this land for you, and I'm going to get you there so that you can be my people? Was that the fulfillment of that promise? Of course not. Of course not. Let's go back to uh, the beginning of the Mosaic Covenant. Exodus chapter 19. This is where it starts to, we start to see the means of how God is going to fulfill this redemptive promise with Israel as a nation. This is really um, uh, the inauguration of his covenant relationship with them as as a nation. The Mosaic Covenant really begins in Exodus 19. And then all the way through to Deuteronomy, this becomes the condition for this covenant. In other words, I'll be your God, you'll be my people. And these are the conditions by which that's going to be be carried out. Look at verse 4. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the sons of Israel. I mean, this becomes the mandate for the nation. The nation was called out of slavery in order to become a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Uh, You don't have to turn here, but just listen to the words that Moses writes later in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7 and 8. He says, You shall consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my statutes and practice them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. They're supposed to be holy because God is holy. God gives them holy commands which are distinct and set apart so that they can live distinct and holy, set apart lives distinct from the nations around them. The nations around them have gods that they worship. Yahweh God is distinct from those gods. As distinct as Yahweh is from the idols of the pagan nations, Israel's life should be as distinct from the lives of the pagan nations. When God fulfills this promise... He's saying, you're going to be a people, Israel, set apart for my purposes. You're going to be holy and distinct, living holy lives. They're going to showcase his glory by how they live. And when that happens, God calls that, I will be your God, you will be my people. Let me show you that real quickly in Exodus, and then we're going to make our way quickly back to Isaiah. So back to Exodus chapter um, 6. Now we're, we're, we're picking up where we left off last time. Chapter 6, verse 6, there, Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will redeem you as, uh, with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And so he's going to get them out of slavery 
and he's going to bring them into a new land. And that's, that's declared then in, in uh, chapter 6 before Moses even gets there. Now, skip after the Exodus, after uh, God brings Israel out of Egypt. Let's look at chapter 29. And in 29, verse 45, there's this interesting um, phrase, this interesting description of God's relationship with the nation via the ministry of the priests. Um, in 29, verse 43, we'll pick it up there. I will meet there with the sons of Israel. This is the, the tent of meeting. This is God's presence. This is where he's going to meet with the sons of Israel. And it shall be consecrated by my glory. His glory is going to take up residence in the midst of a sinful people. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. I will also consecrate Aaron and his sons to minister as priests to me. I will dwell among the sons of Israel, and I will be their God. God's going to dwell among the sons of Israel, and he's going to be their personal God. This is personal presence. God's presence taking up residence among the nation. Now, look at chapter 33. Chapter 33 describes what it's going to look like when God brings the people into a land and when they fulfill the conditions of the covenant. It says, verse 14, God says to Moses, My presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. The presence of God is the rest of the uh, nation of Israel. That's what it means to have rest. And so Moses understands that. He understands that without the presence of God, they don't have a hope. They don't have a chance. Without God's ministry in their life, they can't possibly fulfill the covenant. They can't possibly obey. Verse 15, if your presence doesn't go with us, then do not lead us up from here. And he, so he's just concerned. This has to happen. We have to have your presence or else we can't obey the covenant. If you're familiar with the Torah, I'm sure you are. Blessings and curses of the, of the covenant are listed out in Leviticus chapter 26 and Deuteronomy 27 to 28. For the sake of time, we're not going to read those three chapters. But it would actually be really, really helpful to do that. Read Leviticus 26 and then read Deuteronomy 27 and 28. And just listen to the nature of the curses and the blessings given to the nation. If they fulfill the conditions of the covenant, blessing. If they don't, curses. And read through those specific curses and those specific blessings. And you're going to hear over and over and over again blessings and curses that have to do with their relationship to foreign military powers. Either Israel will have dominion or they won't. They're going to be harassed by their neighbors. And it describes relationship with disease and sicknesses. Either God will deliver them from disease and sickness or they won't. It describes productivity and fertility, a land that's green and luxuriant and produces almost without effort. Or they're struggling to make ends meet because it's barren. All of those blessings and curses have to do with rest. Rest. Rest from the effects of the curse. God cursed the earth and made work difficult. He cursed the earth with sin and disease and sickness and fighting and war. Israel needs to fulfill the conditions of the covenant to find rest. And God says in Exodus 33, verse 14, my presence is your rest. And so the news that God's going to show up personally, that's good news. That's good news. So fast forward now to the book of Isaiah. How are they doing in Isaiah How's the, how's the nation doing? Are they fulfilling the condition of the covenant? Of course not. Look at chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. Here's the description of the nation. He says uh, in verse 2, chapter 1, verse 2, Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks. Sons I have reared and brought up, they have revolted against me. An ox knows its owner and a donkey its master's uh, manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away from him. Where will you be stricken again? As you continue in your rebellion, the whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there's nothing sound in it, only bruises, welts, and raw wounds, not pressed out or bandaged, nor softened with oil. 
Your land is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. I mean, of course that's the case. They are experiencing the curses of the covenant because their hearts are so far from God. They've despised God. They are not listening to his word. They, do, they are not relating to him in, with brokenness or humility or obedience or any such thing. So, of course, verse 7 is true. The land is desolate. The cities are burned with fire. Your fields, strangers are devouring them in your presence. It is desolation as overthrown by strangers. Verse 7 sounds like a virtual summary of all the curses in the Torah. And that's the description of the experience of Israel under Isaiah's ministry. Verse 8, the daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a watchman's hut in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. Unless the Lord of hosts had left us few survivors, we would be like Sodom. We would be like Gomorrah. It's only the God's grace that Israel is even still standing as a nation in Isaiah's day. So when we get to the book of Isaiah, we realize the nation's not doing well. It describes the nation as thirsty and hungry, lame and mute, blind and deaf. And you can see that in dozens, literally dozens of passages in the book of Isaiah. The nation is not doing well. The reason why they're not doing well is because their way is not God's way. The way is not just a circuitous route through the wilderness because of sin getting into a promised land. Here they are in Israel's day, I'm sorry, Isaiah's day. Israel is actually in the land and they are not doing well. They're experiencing the curses of the covenant. They are experiencing uh, dominion from foreign lands, foreign rulers, pagan powers. Militarily, they are weak. They cannot defend themselves. They are experiencing sickness and disease and infirmity and blight. And agriculturally, they are not being blessed. They are barely making it. Because they are sin sick. They are sin sick. The way is God's path to bring his people into a position of blessing. The word way is used over 45 times in the book of Isaiah. It makes for a fascinating study. I'm not going to read all those to you, but I am going to show you a couple here. Let me give you a couple of examples. I'll show you the first one. The first one is chapter 2, um, verse 3. Many peoples will come in the last day. It's talking about the last day from verse 2. Many people will come in that last day and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways. And it's fascinating that the first use of the word way is actually God's way. It's the way that God walks. It's the way that God acts. It's the way that God conducts himself. When way is used in Isaiah, most of the time, however, it's actually used of the nation or the people. How is the nation acting? How is the nation walking? How, how are they conducting themselves? As you saw already in Isaiah 40, verse 3, it says, make ready the way of the Lord. That's one of the unique instances where it's talking about the way of Yahweh, namely the way of Yahweh coming back to earth to establish the fulfillment of all that's been promised in the Torah as Isaiah is preaching to his, to his audience. Let me give you a few examples here. Um, look at chapter 43, verse 16. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way through the sea and a path through mighty waters, who brings forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the mighty man. They, they lie down together and will not rise again. They've been quenched and extinguished like a wick. He evokes the image of the Exodus he brings back into their mind the power of God to bring them out of slavery into the promised land through a Red Sea, opening up the Red Sea so they walk through on dry ground and then drown the army behind them. That is the way of the Lord. He's going to get them there. Now they're already in the promised land. What is lacking is the fulfillment of the conditions of the Mosaic Covenant. Their hearts are still hard. They are still far from God. For God to be promising, look, here comes Yahweh, if their way is not God's way, that is bad news for that generation. In fact, I, gotta, I, can't, I can't skip chapter 30. Go back to chapter 30. There's a prophecy here of the, of the, of the way. Um, in chapter 30, verse 11, 
is the first instance of way in this chapter, and it says, get out of the way, turn aside from the path, let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. That's talking about false teachers telling uh, righteous people, get out of the way, stop telling us about the Holy One of Israel. We don't want to hear anymore about his promises or his righteousness or what he wants from us. We want to live how we want to live. Skip down to verse 18. This is a profound blessing um, that really pops in chapters 1 through 39. It sounds like it belongs in chapters 41, 40 to 66. But in verse 18, Isaiah writes, Therefore the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore he waits on high to have compassion on you, for the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are all those who long for him. O people in Zion, inhabitant in Jerusalem, you will weep no longer. He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. Although the Lord has given you bread of privation and water of oppression, he, your teacher, will no longer hide himself, but your eyes will behold your teacher. Notice it's the Lord himself who becomes their teacher. And notice that the Lord himself gave them privation. He brought the curses of the covenant in order to turn their hearts back to him. But he says, here's the promise. God himself will teach you. He will instruct you. Verse 21, your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way Walk in it whenever you turn to the right or to the left. When, you, when God comes back and he reigns on earth, he's going to be telling Israel, this is the way. Walk in it. What stands out about this use of the word way is it's not exclusively Yahweh's way and nor is it exclusively Israel's way. It's both. Israel walking in Yahweh's way. Verse 22, and you will defile your graven images overlaid with silver and your molten images plated with gold. You'll scatter them as an impure thing and say to them, be gone. And he'll give you rain for the seed which you will sow in the ground and bread from the yield of the ground. And it will be rich and plenteous. On that day your livestock will graze in a roomy pasture. Also the oxen and the donkeys which work the ground will eat salted fodder. Will eat, yeah, sorry, will eat salted fodder which has been winnowed with shovel and fork. And no wonder when you read these prophecies, you see these prophecies of blessing that are so clearly literal and so clearly spiritual all at once. Which one is it? Is this fulfillment going to involve the deliverance of Israel from physical sickness or spiritual? Yes. From physical enemies or spiritual enemies? Yes. I mean... For Israel's hearts to be turned back to the Lord is, by virtue of the blessing of the covenant, deliverance from spiritual enemies. And so this is indeed good news for Israel. This is indeed good news and comfort to a nation that is, has compromised. Well, we know from our prophecy that it's God. Can we say anything more about it? One more thing. Look at Isaiah chapter 4. Who is this who comes? We know it's the Lord. We know it's God from Isaiah 40. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 2. In that day the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride of the, and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. It will come about that he who is left in Zion will, and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. This is talking about a, a fulfillment. Finally, the people of God will be holy, everyone who's recorded for life in Jerusalem. When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning, then the Lord will create over the whole area of the Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day, even smoke, and the brightness of flaming fire by night, for over, for over all the glory will be a canopy. Remember that from last week? The angel of the Lord, who went before the people in a pillar of fire by night, pillar of cloud by day. This is none other than the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, the messenger of God, the messenger of the covenant. Skip over to chapter 11. This is the shoot who springs forth from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. This is a son of Jesse because he's a son of David. The spirit of the Lord is going to rest on him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding. And according to verse 11, it will happen on that day, um, I'm sorry, verse 10, then in that day the nations will resort to the root of Jesse. Well, is he, the, is he the offspring of Jesse or the root? And the answer is, of course, yes. 
This is the divine person who now comes into human existence. He's personally never began. <laughs> An infinite, eternal being who takes on humanity. And he comes to earth as the son of David, the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the covenant. And then, of course, we skip to the last half of Isaiah, the suffering servant. The suffering servant who has to die in the place of the nation, who has to rise and he'll see the corporate seed with his own eyes, according to Isaiah 53, verse 11. And that was for Israel in Isaiah's day. That's the way, Israel. They were in the land. But they weren't fulfilling the conditions of the covenant. And so now we have way in Exodus, we have way in Isaiah, and we have way in Malachi, post-exilic. They're already back in the land. They're already back from the Babylonian exile, and they are still not fulfilling the covenant. And he says, soon, Yahweh in whom you delight, he's coming to the temple. This is profound. These prophecies are pointing forward to one to come who's going to fulfill all these promises. The Son of God, the angel of the Lord, the messenger, the son of David, a divine human individual. He's going to come. And in Exodus, God says, I'm coming. In Isaiah, God says, I'm coming. In Malachi, God says, I'm coming to my temple. And in Mark, Mark said he came. This is good news indeed. Father, we just want to thank you for this time and your word. And it's just so rich, just doing a little bit of study as we trace these threads throughout the Old Testament of uh, these prophecies that are so critical to understand the stories we're about to enjoy in the book of Mark. I just pray, Lord, that they would um, benefit us by helping us to see your glory in a way that we ought to. Um, perhaps it's a refreshment of what we've already known, or perhaps it's an introduction to something new, but regardless, Lord, we want to see your glory. And so our prayer in light of this prophecy about beholding our God, we just ask, Lord, help us to see your glory. Open our eyes to see wondrous things in your law. Help us to see your glory as you've revealed it on the pages of Scripture. And thank you for even answering our prayer at the very beginning to show us the glory of your Son. Thank you for ministering to us, your humble, lowly, broken servants. We just want to be faithful. In your name we pray. Amen.